I received an urgent phone call from Cindy early Wednesday afternoon saying that someone had hacked into her GCash account and all the money was gone. Apparently, she wasn't paying attention and went to a spoof, fake GCash website and entered in her PIN number, thinking it was the official site. She had called me to ask me what to do. And of course, the first thing we did was to reset her PIN number and take back the account. And the second thing we did was to file a report with GCash to try to reverse the transactions. But don't feel too bad for her because not a lot was stolen. In fact, her GCash balance was running low and she had asked me that morning to transfer her some money from my GCash account to hers. However, we had a disagreement the previous night and we were actually fighting and not talking to each other that Wednesday morning. So I pretended not to see her request and ignore her and never send her money to top up her GCash account because that's what adults do when they fight. They act like kids. So her GCash account was zeroed out by the hacker before I had the chance to top up her balance. If I had sent the money she had requested, we would both be crying because the hacker would have taken so much more. So instead of getting too upset, we were thanking God we had a divinely appointed fight so that the hacker didn't walk away with more money. You see, my friends, life is like that at times. We wonder why we're going through so many challenges and experiencing so many difficulties, but yet what we don't know is that it's all working out for our best. Our faith in God wavers at the first sign of trouble or when we hit a road bump in life instead of persevering with an unwavering faith in uncertain times. We do live in uncertain times at any life stage. We wonder what the economy will look like in the future. We wonder how learning will happen with hybrid schooling. We are unsure what our health prognosis will be. We wonder how our children will turn out. We wonder if we will ever get married or if we will have children. We wonder if we will be promoted or if we will still have a job. And we have many other concerns. All of these uncertainties and challenges weigh on us and cause our faith to waver. How do we cultivate an unwavering faith in the Lord to get through difficult and uncertain times? That's what we want to take a look at as we continue our sermon series titled, When Giants Walk the Earth, as we study the first 11 chapters in the book of Genesis. So if you have your Bibles, would you please turn with me to the book of Genesis chapter 7 as we study verses 1 to 24. Genesis chapter 7, verses 1 to 24, as we pick up where we last left off with Noah obediently building by faith the ark that God had instructed him to build. I read now verses 1 to 3. Then the Lord said to Noah, come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. You shall take with you seven each of every clean animal, a male and his female, two each of animals that are unclean, a male and his female, also seven each of birds of the air, male and female, to keep the species alive on the face of all the earth." In verse 1, the Bible tells us that it was time for Noah and his family to enter the ark which they had completed building. By God's grace, Noah's family would be saved as he lived a righteous life in contrast to the wicked and sinful generation that surrounded him. Noah was given further instruction to take on animals onto the boat with him. Now, if I were to give you a quick quiz question right now, how many of each kind of animal did Noah bring to the ark? what would be your answer? I'm sure most of you would answer two of every kind because that is what has been taught to you in Sunday school and what you see depicted in storybooks, pictures, and videos. But that answer would be wrong. If we read the Bible carefully, we see that God instructed Noah to bring two pairs of the unclean animals, a male and a female, but seven pairs of clean animals and flying creatures, seven males and seven females. So just to note a few things, we're not told in the text what constitutes clean animals and what animals are unclean. But when the Mosaic law was given, God defined for the people of Israel what was considered clean and unclean. However, we can assume that what was considered clean and unclean in the time of Noah was the same list that was given to the people of Israel, as the list may have changed. In fact, today in the church age, there are no distinctions between clean and unclean animals as Acts chapter 10 so clearly teaches. 
But in the time of Noah, there was clearly a distinction, and he was to bring to the ark more of the clean animals than the unclean. Also, the Hebrew literally reads, Shiva, Shiva, translated seven, seven. So does it mean that Noah brought in seven clean animals of each kind or 14 clean animals, seven pairs of each kind? Arguments can be made for both, but it seems better to take it as 14 clean animals or seven pairs because when you used to describe one pair of two unclean animals of each kind, the Hebrew is shenaim, shenaim, literally translated two, two, which no one argues that it refers to one pair. So for linguistic consistency, it would be better to take it as seven pairs of each kind of clean animals. But whatever the case, there are more than two of each kind of clean animals and flying creatures. Some of you may be worried that the ark could not possibly hold so many animals. But don't worry, there was enough space in the ark for these animals. Because the phrase of each kind doesn't mean that Noah took into the boat, for example, all the species of dogs. He only took two dogs, a male and a female of the kind. And yes, this includes dinosaurs because the Bible says of all animals and birds. Some of you may be wondering why there are many more of the clean animals than the unclean animals brought into the ark. Well, the answer is in the biblical text. In verse 3, we're told that seven pairs were brought into the ark in order to keep the animals alive. And in chapter 6, we studied how one of the responsibilities was for Noah to keep his family and the animals which would repopulate the earth after the flood alive. Human and animals survive with food. And where would the food source come from? Well, logically, the food source would have to come from the clean animals. Because if there were only two of each kind, and the animals ate each other, even by accident, or if Noah and his family ate the animals for food, even just one of the two, then you would have immediate extinction of certain kinds of animals on the ark. Also in chapter 8, we're told that Noah later sacrificed some clean animals and flying creatures to the Lord, so there had to be some buffer in the animal count. That's what the Bible says, seven pairs of each clean animal of each kind was brought into the ark. Look with me at verses 4 and 5. For after seven more days, I will cause it to rain on the earth forty days and forty nights, and I will destroy from the face of the earth all living things that I have made. And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. We're told in verse 4 that God told Noah he had seven days to get ready to go into the ark because then it would rain 40 days and 40 nights. And through this worldwide global flood, all living things on the earth would die. Now note something in verse 5. We're simply told that Noah did all that God had commanded. As we previously mentioned in our study in chapter 6, Noah's deep faith was such that he expressed that faith in full obedience to God, trusting that God knew what he was doing, even if Noah may not have fully understood the rationale for doing it, such as building a large boat and the number and types of animals he was to bring on board. It is recorded in the Scripture that Noah did not give any reasons or excuses for why he should delay or not do what God had instructed He didn't say to God, Lord, I'm too old. It's 600 years old for this adventure. Can't you just wait until I die to send the flood? Or Lord, I need more than seven days to say goodbye to all of my friends and family. In fact, as Noah was about to enter a time of great uncertainty, stepping into the ark, there were no questions of why. The Bible simply states he trusted God and did what God commanded him to do. God said, enter the ark, and Noah did. It wasn't filled with a lot of questions like, how far will we be going? How long will this journey take? Or Lord, how do I take care of these animals I didn't even know existed? Or Lord, I'm not a vet. What if the animals get sick? God simply said, it's time. And Noah's reply was, let's go. My friends, I know it's very natural for us to ask a lot of questions and have concerns when we enter times of uncertainties. But as I've often said, the Scriptures teach us that living by faith has never been about fully understanding. It's about us trusting in a God who knows what He's doing. 
And that's why in the midst of our worries, anxieties, and unease, living in uncertain times, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 and 7 reminds us, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon Him, for He cares for you. However, let me just point out that Noah entered into the ark without any reservation, not because he was blindly following in faith, but because he was prepared to live by faith. What do I mean? Well, many of us have the notion that to live by faith is to simply trust in God in times of uncertainty as a kind of mental decision. But this mental decision, without living it out in practice, is very tenuous and shaky at best. Because in our mind games, our worries overwhelm our desire to trust God. Noah's faith was an active faith a faith lived out in action that further strengthened his faith. Noah built the ark by faith as per God's instructions. He knew that this boat would be seaworthy because it was based on God's instructions. That's why he confidently walked in by faith and entered the ark. He also brought in the animals as God had instructed him to do. So he knew there were enough animals for his family of eight to survive on. This act would have bolstered his faith to lead his family to enter the ark when God instructed him. You see, my friends, if we want to live by faith in times of uncertainties, we have to put in the work to build up our faith. It isn't just deciding one day, I'm going to trust God, and then doing nothing about it. Because at the first sign of trouble, our mind plays games with us, and our worries and fear will quickly overwhelm our mental decision to, quote-unquote, trust God. Perhaps this illustration will help you understand the point I'm trying to make. Years ago, a farmer was looking for a farmhand to work on his farm on the Atlantic coast, known for quick and severe storms that would blow away many things. As he interviewed a particular worker, the farmer asked, are you a good farmhand? The little man interviewing said, well, I can sleep when the wind blows. Although puzzled by the answer, the farmer hired him. The farmhand worked well around the farm, busy from dawn to dusk, and the farmer felt satisfied with the man's work. Then one night, a storm came in, and the wind howled loudly from offshore. Jumping out of bed, the farmer grabbed the lantern and rushed next door to the hired hand's sleeping quarters. He shook the farmhand and yelled, Get up, get up! A storm is coming! Tie things down before they blow away! The farmhand rolled over in bed and said firmly, No, sir, I told you, I can sleep when the wind blows. Enraged by the man's response, the farmer was tempted to fire him on the spot, but instead he hurried outside to prepare for the storm. To his amazement, he discovered that all the haystacks had been covered with tarpaulin. The cows were in the barn, the chickens were in the coops, and the doors were barred. The shutters were tightly secured. Everything was tied down. Nothing could blow away. The farmer then understood what the hired hand meant, and he too returned to also sleep while the wind blew. My friends, when we have done our preparations to live by faith, then we have nothing to fear entering the unknown. Can you sleep when the wind of uncertainty blows through your life? The hired hand in the story was able to sleep because he had secured the farm against the storm whenever it came. Similarly, we secure ourselves against the storms of life by grounding ourselves firmly in the Word of God and knowing the character of God. While the object of our faith must be Almighty God, the level and strength of our faith is based on how much we know Him and walk with Him. One of my favorite stories is told by Tim Hansel. In this story, he recounts, In my late 20s, a bunch of my friends and I decided to sail around the world. I have to admit, though, at times I was a bit worried. I had never sailed before. I was uneasy and anxious. So I spent a lot of time reading the Bible and praying about it until it dawned on me that God was whispering, Tim, I'll give you peace and assurance when you read some books on sailing and actually sail. The reason you're anxious is not due to a lack of prayer but to your lack of sailing knowledge. 
Tim recounts, I wasn't unprayerful. I was unskilled. So I took a step I needed to take to let God work peace in my heart. I began reading about sailing and trying it out. That's what I want to pound into your hearts and heads. The reason we have so much trouble living by faith in times of uncertainty is because sadly, we're often too lazy to do the prep work to build up and strengthen our faith. Instead of being proactive and preparing for uncertain times, we're only reactive to when challenges come our way. Noah entered the ark without reservation because he was prepared. He had built the ark well. He had made provisions for him and his family as the Lord had instructed. He wasn't just holding on to a piece of wood when the time came and said, Lord, I have faith you will protect me through this global flood. God would have replied, but I told you to build an ark. And so putting it all together as we draw our first biblical principle, biblical principle number one, unwavering faith in uncertain times requires preparation and planning. Unwavering faith in uncertain times requires preparation and planning. My friends, if we don't put in the spiritual disciplines to grow our faith, then our faith will surely waver when it is tested. It all boils down to the type of faith foundation we prepare. If we have done what God has told us to do in the Bible to strengthen our faith, then we can enter into uncertainties confidently just as Noah did when he entered the ark confidently when it was time. I read now verses 6 to 12. Noah was 600 years old when the floodwaters were on the earth. So Noah with his sons, his wife, and his sons' wives went into the ark because of the waters of the flood. Of clean animals, of animals that are unclean, of birds, and of everything that creeps on the earth, two by two they went into the ark to Noah, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were on the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain was on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Here in these verses, we're told that Noah was 600 years old when God's judgment on the wicked and sinful world in which he lived was unleashed through a global flood. The Bible tells us that it rained for 40 days and 40 nights and that the fountains of the great deep were broken up, meaning there were great movements in the earth's tectonic plates. The earth as we know it today was fundamentally altered from before during this great flood and as the flood waters receded. It didn't take millions and billions of years to get the varying landforms we have today. A singular catastrophic event like a global flood and its accompanying tectonic movements would have given us the vast canyons and soaring mountains we have today. In fact, on May 18th of 1980, when the volcano Mount St. Helens suddenly erupted, it produced similar rock layers and geographic formations in a single eruption that some scientists insist required millions of years to form. Also, during this global flood, the waters took the plants and animals and buried them quickly where they became fossils. There are many skeptics today who question a worldwide global flood that covered the entire world, killed off all living creatures, and giving us the fossils and geological profile we have today. I encourage those of you with doubts to do your own unbiased research to see if the scientific data supports a global flood or not. I've done my research, and while not all of my questions have been answered, what I've read and researched do not disprove the biblical account. Now bear with me as I wander into the world of science for a moment to present some evidences for a global flood. From the world of geology, one geological feature that points to a global flood is the vast stretches of horizontal rock strata. As Robert Koffel notes, everywhere in the world, thousands to hundreds of thousands of square miles of flat horizontal strata from a few feet to hundreds of feet thick are found. These formations are composed of sandstone, gray whack, shale, conglomerate, limestone, and other types of rock. Some of them extend for thousands of miles spanning whole continents. For example, the St. Peter sandstone, composed of clean quartz grains, have been traced in 20 states from California to Vermont. 
the Shinarab conglomerate in the U.S. Southwest covers some 125,000 square miles. And another conglomerate blanket is reported to extend from New Mexico to Saskatchewan and Alberta. A continental blanket of clean sandstone before being deposited required a steadily flowing current traversing a great distance to separate the sand from the silt and gravel. A continental blanket of conglomerate required a continent-sized maelstrom of water in violent, chaotic motion to dump an ungraded mixture of material of all sizes across thousands of miles of terrain. Tremendous water action such as that, which would be produced by a global flood, seems to offer the only reasonable explanation for the observed facts. Another evidence for a global flood is that the embedded fossils in rock layers should have the simple fossils at the bottom and the complex ones on the top of the rock layer, which is the order in which evolution supposedly occurred. However, evidence in many places around the world have it in reverse order with complex fossils at the bottom layers, which cannot be explained by folds or thrust fault forces. Dr. Walter Lamberts has compiled many examples of this. One would be the Lewis Overthrust, which is a mountain range covering 13,000 square miles in Montana and British Columbia. They have found algae fossils in the upper layers, rocks classified as Precambrian Dolomite, which are supposedly a billion years older than the complex marine fossil in the lower layers classified as Cretaceous Shale. Evolutionists explain it away as being a fault overthrust. But the physical evidence of an entire system of mountain ranges sliding 30 to 60 miles up on top of underlying strata is simply absent. Also, there are many types of pollen found in supposed Precambrian rocks that are not supposed to be there because flowering plants would appear half a billion years too early to fit into the theory of evolution. And yet, they are there. Mass burial sites, also called fossil graveyards, with millions of dinosaurs and other animal fossils and bones from supposedly different climate zones would point to a global flood and cannot be explained by evolutionary science. For example, in the Cumberland Cavern in Maryland, there are remains of animals from cold northern regions, warm, damp, semi-tropical regions, and from more arid, dry environments. Also in the Baltic amber deposits, and the Geisaltal lignite seams in Germany. It contains fossilized insects, plants, and animal remains from different areas of the earth from the near Arctic to tropical zones and transported from Africa, the East Indies, and South America, all dumped in Northern Europe. The same phenomena are found in other parts of the world, like the Agate Spring Quarry in Nebraska, the Siwalik Hill fossil beds in India, and the fossil fish graveyard strata in Lompoc, California, the old red sandstone in Scotland, and many other places in France, Italy, Germany, and Switzerland. How do they all end up together, if not all for a global flood that brought these animals uncharacteristically together? Another evidence is that fossils are placed in rock strata where they're not supposed to be in. For example, we find large numbers of sea creature fossils at the top of mountain ranges all over the world as further indication of a global catastrophe where the ocean waters totally flooded the continents. These are evidences you don't hear much about because it ruins the evolutionist narrative about there not being a global flood. There are lots more evidences for a global flood but I hope you will take an unbiased look at the fossil and geological evidences out there and discern whether or not it supports a global worldwide flood as the Bible speaks of. But let us again focus on Noah and his faith in uncertain times. The Bible tells us two times that he was 600 years old when all of this happened. My friends, age does not give us a free pass from experiencing uncertainties and the anxieties that come with it. Experiencing the unknown is a lifelong experience because nothing is certain in life. So it's important that we learn how to live by faith when faced with uncertainties in life because it is a lifelong issue, even until the point of death. As students, we wonder how well we will do in school. As a high school senior, we wonder what college will accept us. 
As a college student, we wonder what type of job we will have when we graduate. As a professional, we wonder how we will make ends meet or how successful we will be. As a young adult, we wonder whom we will marry. As parents, we wonder how our children will grow up. As elderly people, we wonder who will take care of us and about our health. And in many other examples, our lives are marked by uncertainties. But when we learn to cultivate unwavering faith by relying on the promises of the Bible and knowing well the character of God and making sure we have accepted the love of God as evidence through His Son, Jesus Christ, who died in our place to give us salvation and eternal life, then we can live well. We can live well at each stage of our life, even with the uncertainties. That's why Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7 says this. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. My friends, is the peace of God through your unwavering faith in Him a mark of your life at any stage of your life? May it be so. I read now verses 13 to 16. On the very same day in Noah and Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his son with them entered the ark. They and every beast after its kind, all cattle after their kind, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind, and every bird after its kind, every bird of every sort. And they went into the ark to Noah two by two, of all flesh in which is the breath of life. So those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. In these verses, the Bible tell us that eight human beings went into the boat, Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives, and then, of course, two of each kind of unclean animals and seven pairs of each clean animal and birds. Now, the question is often asked, how did Noah collect all of these animals and birds? It would have taken forever to do so, and then to guide all of the wild animals to obediently enter the ark by twos. This would have been an impossible task. But you know, Noah didn't have to go looking for these animals. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 6, verse 20, that God already told Noah that the animals would come to him. It is not impossible for a God who is able to do the impossible when he is the creator of the world to do as he has said. For he is the one who can part the Red Sea and calm the storm with just one declaration. Remember the astonishment of the disciples when God the Son, Jesus Christ, God himself, calmed the raging storm with just a command. Matthew chapter 8, verses 26 to 27. But he said to them, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. So the men marveled, saying, Who can this be? that even the winds and the sea obey Him. Our God, with just one command, can calm the storm at sea. Can He not with one command command the animals, two by two, to walk in orderly into the ark? Perhaps the people of Noah's time may have wondered, who is this God of Noah that even the animals obediently go into the boat by pairs? But to show you the hardness of their heart, And the wickedness of these people, not a single person who saw the animals going into the ark wondered how it was happening and inquired from Noah about the God who enabled this and would soon destroy the world. It just shows you that even if there were more miracles today, that people would still not believe because of their hard hearts. Even if an angel appeared today to declare the truth, our wicked world would probably not believe just like they did not believe in the time of Noah, nor did they believe in the time of Jesus' first coming. Because it's not about seeing. It's about what we believe by faith. You see, what we believe about God determines if we will believe what is recorded in the Bible. Because if for you God is small and can't do very much, then the account in Genesis seems like an absurdity and an impossibility. But if for you God is all-powerful and is able to do miracles and the impossible that he can easily control the animals and the birds that he wants to enter the ark and for them to come by pairs. If we believe in a great and almighty God who can do this miraculous act with animals as he is commanded, 
that we can also believe that He can rise from the dead just as He said. And we can also believe that we can have eternal life by simply believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross just as He said. I hope you see my point. The Bible tells us in verse 16 that when all that God had intended to be saved were in the ark, it was God who shut the door of the ark and sealed the boat. Here's a picture of God's perfect timing and protection because no one and no animal that was supposed to be in the boat was left out and not in it. And the Lord closing the door pictures that all inside are safe. Safety was found inside the ark. Everywhere else on the outside was unsafe. A reminder that it is in the hands of God that we are truly safe from life's uncertainties. And putting it all together, we now have our second biblical principle, biblical principle number two. Living by faith in an almighty God is an essential life skill because uncertain times will come at every life stage. Living by faith in an almighty God is an essential life skill because uncertain times will come at every life stage. My friends, uncertainty is part of God's plan for us to experience at every life stage because with uncertainty comes reliance upon Him and humility to acknowledge our inadequacies. So it is incumbent upon us to learn to live by faith in our Almighty God now so that we can continue to be at peace in whatever life stage we enter and whatever we experience in life. Learn to live in the center of God's protective and perfect will, for there we can enjoy life with a peace of mind. I read now verses 17 to 24. Now the flood was on the earth 40 days. The waters increased and lifted up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and greatly increased on the earth, and the ark moved about on the surface of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth, and all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed 15 cubits upward, and the mountains were covered. And all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds and cattle and beasts and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth and every man. All in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life, all that was on the dry land died. So he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground, both man and cattle, creeping thing and bird of the air. They were destroyed from the earth. Only Noah and those who were with them in the ark remained alive. And the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. Verses 17 to 24 tells us that the flood waters covered everything. There was no refuge on the earth to find safety and salvation except on the ark. God's rightful judgment was now upon the earth for the sins and the wickedness of mankind. Can you just imagine all of those rotting corpses of people and animals who died by flood and the stench that would have filtered into the ark? Death was all around them except those in the ark found salvation. The Bible says they remained alive, life in the midst of death. Also, this was no cruise boat. It was probably a very bumpy boat ride as they were tossed left and right by the waves and perhaps as they ran into some of the tops of the trees and mountains. We've already noted that there were no control systems or a rudder system to steer the boat. The boat was completely controlled by God. Perhaps this was a very vivid lesson for Noah and his family, that when they fully trust and give their lives into the hands of God, they are completely safe and secured. However, it doesn't mean it would be a smooth ride. It was still a bumpy ride. It would not have been a great experience for them. Remember, no one his family were not sailors and would have probably not been too used to the motion of the boat. If any of you have ever experienced seasickness or motion sickness, it is no fun. I've experienced it for days and it was no fun. I remember many years ago, as part of our honeymoon, Cindy and I went on a four-day, three-night cruise to the Bahamas. It was an amazingly cheap ticket in December to go to the Caribbeans, and so we booked the ticket and drove to Florida. We wondered why it was so cheap. Well, after getting onto the cruise boat, we soon found out. Apparently, for experienced cruisers, you don't go cruising to the Bahamas in December because of the rough waters. And so instead of a romantic, wonderful experience of our first cruise trip, 
we spent four days and three nights in our cabins wishing we had never gotten onto the boat, feeling nauseated the entire time, could not enjoy the food, and could not wait to get off the boat as soon as possible. I can only imagine the constant motion and seasickness for 40 days as it rained and the waves that accompanied it. It would have been miserable, but what is most important is that they were safe. My friends, we should be reminded that even though we are safely in God's protective hands, when we fully trust Him by faith, it doesn't mean we won't experience discomforts or challenges. We forget at times that trusting God doesn't mean it will always be smooth sailing all the time, but only that we will make it safely to the end and have the strength to make it through the day. I'm reminded of that wonderful poem by Annie Johnson Flint, which was turned into a great hymn. She wrote these words, God hath not promised skies always blue, flowers strewn pathways all our lives through. God hath not promised sun without rain, joy without sorrow, peace without pain. God hath not promised we shall not know, toil and temptation, trouble and woe. He hath not told us we shall not bear, many a burden, many a care. God hath not promised smooth roads and wide, swift easy travel, needing no guide. Never a mountain, rocky and steep, never a river, turbid and deep. But what has He promised? Annie Thompson concludes, But God hath promised strength for the day, rest for the labor, light for the way, grace for the trials, help from above, unfailing sympathy, undying love. And that's so true. The Bible tells us God has promised those things, strength for the day, rest from our labors, light for the way, grace for the trials, help from above, unfailing sympathy, undying love. So my friends, don't bail on God the first time you hit a bump in the road or when you encounter difficulties or when challenges arise. Encountering those things doesn't mean God's protection is not with you to provide safe passage to the storms of uncertainty. And that's our third biblical principle. Biblical principle number three, faith in God's protection for safe passage through the storms of uncertainty does not mean it is without challenges. Faith in God's protection for safe passage through the storms of uncertainty does not mean it is without challenges. Remove from your mindset or your thinking that trusting God by faith somehow means that no problems will ever come your way. And somehow the problems, difficulties, and challenges do come, then you will no longer trust in God. God will provide safety and protection. Just know it may come with challenges. Perhaps this illustration will put this principle into perspective. A commanding general in Korea was inspecting his troop one sunny afternoon when three sniper bullets from a nearby hill whizzed over his head, causing him to jump into a bunker with a sergeant. Locate that sniper, snapped the general. We know exactly where he is, sir, the sergeant retorted calmly. Why don't you shoot him then, demanded the general. The sergeant explained, well, sir, that fellow has been sniping at this hill for six weeks now and hasn't hit anybody yet. We are afraid if we kill him, they might replace him with one that can actually shoot. My friends, the challenges you're going through now may be for your good to protect you from danger down the road. Just like my disagreement and fight with Cindy in the morning prevented us from having more money stolen later in the afternoon. Look again at the end of verse 23. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. In spite of all the death and destruction happening outside and all around the ark, and even though the ride on the ark was rough, what is most important is that everyone in the ark remained alive. Perhaps this should be our perspective, that in spite of what we're going through in life, we know that we have eternal life provided through placing our trust in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, so all is well. Don't focus on the challenges. Focus on the fact of our eternal salvation. So my friends, you and I can embrace uncertainties and challenges in life with the certainty of God's protective hand. Because it might be living by faith and choosing to head into that uncertainty 
that may be what saves you. Steve Smith wrote, I read one time about how shipbuilders back in the days of sailboats would prepare the masts for their ships. They would go to the forest and find an appropriate tree. Then they would clear out all the surrounding trees and leave that one standing, leaving it exposed to the wind and storms. As the tree continued to mature, it would gain strength, the kind of strength it would need to be able to stand up in the storms at sea while holding a large sail. But that tree would never gain that strength if it was just left among the other trees. It developed strength because of the storms. I believe that if we build our lives on the solid rock of Jesus and His words, then when the storms come, we will not only survive, we will gain strength. So remember, number one, unwavering faith in uncertain times requires preparation and planning. Number two, living by faith in an almighty God is an essential life skill because uncertain times will come at every life stage. Number three, Faith in God's protection for safe passage to the storms of uncertainty does not mean it is without challenges. So, my friends, may you and I cultivate unwavering faith in these uncertain times. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank You for these biblical principles that remind us that we can have unwavering faith in uncertain times. Father, we do live in uncertain times, but often our faith is so conditional that we want it so that there are no challenges that we have to undergo. But may it be that we focus on the truth of Your Word in our relationship with You so that our faith, our unwavering faith, will continue to be strengthened and solidified so that whatever we go through in this life, we will stand firm. Heavenly Father, I pray that You would continue to uphold and encourage each one of us who are going through times of challenge and difficulties that we would continue to look to You, the author and the finisher of our faith, for our strength. Father, we love You, and we thank You for all You do in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.